Good evening, everybody. I'm Anthony Nedwick. I'm the Dean of the Golden Gate University School of Law, and I want to welcome you to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and to the 11th Annual Ronald George Distinguished Lecture Series. So welcome. This is a very special night because this is also our 50th anniversary. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Golden Gate Law Review. Um, and as many of you know, um, I've been gone for a couple months on medical leave, but I needed to be here tonight because this is such an important event. Uh, we get to showcase our best and our brightest students uh, tonight. And we also get to celebrate, it's very special because we have a couple of our distinguished alumni that are here tonight. Um, we have uh, Judge Morgan Christian of the Ninth Circuit, who is a 1986 graduate, and then Superior Court Judge Ann Mormon, who's a 1987 graduate of the law school. So welcome to them. Named after Chief Judge of California, Ronald George, this event highlights the vital role courts play in our democracy, which is becoming more and more important in recent years. It is also a time when we get to hear from our law review, um, talk about their, discuss their notes on the most recent cases that they put in the law review. And I hope you all get a chance to read that edition because you'll get to see really the greatness of our students and see why we're so proud. And it'll also give you great confidence in the future of the legal profession because these are just great students. But I have the honor tonight to introduce the editor-in-chief of the Law Review, Kendall Curry, who will introduce the, the students and others here tonight. Um, Kendall is just one of those students who, whenever you see her, you're always so happy because she's such uh, a positive uh, force whenever you're around her. She's smart, she's organized, she's very professional. Um, and I think she's at school more often than I am. I don't know, there's been a time when I've been at school when I haven't seen her in the hallway, so she works hard. But the students who've been on Law Review know that that's just the life, right? I remember three o'clock in the morning on Saturday mornings doing site checks, most awful period of time in law school for sure, so uh, kudos to you. Uh, Kindle represents what is so special about Golden Gate and why I'm so proud of, of all of our students. Um, she doesn't know this, but one of the things I like to do when I'm introducing students is go back to their application to law school to see why they came here and read their essay mostly is what I like to do. Uh, and her essay was unbelievably great. So it's not a big surprise that she's an excellent student as well. Um, she put in her essay, she talked a lot about how she got to the point that she was, but really it pushed her how important it was to really advocate on for social justice issues. And there's a quote in her uh, paper that I just loved. Um, so it's good, don't worry. You, you, yeah, I'm not gonna embarrass you that badly. Um, but she said, the goal of social justice advocate is not for the presenter to be heard, but rather for the advocate to put the disadvantage in a position that they can be heard. And I thought that that was just a really great way to summarize it. And I'm confident that she's gonna go into the profession and be exactly that type of an advocate on behalf of all those people that need to be empowered. Um, not surprisingly, she's excelled in law school. She's near the top of her class. Um, she's clerked for uh, Judge Susan Ilston in the United States District Court in the Northern District. And she also worked in the, our pro bono tax clinic at, at the school. So please welcome Kendall Curry. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Nidwicki, for that very kind, uh, detailed um, introduction. And good evening, everyone. As Dean Nidwicki shared, my name is Kendall Curry, and I have the pleasure of serving as this year's Editor-in-Chief for the Golden Gate University Law, um, Law Review. Excuse me. I would first like to start by sharing a little bit about the Law Review. Founded in 1969, the Golden Gate University Law Review publishes two issues every year. The first of those two issues is the Ninth Circuit Survey Edition, which is exclusively dedicated to analyzing the decisions of the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. The survey is comprised of student-written pieces, each highlighting the pivotal recent decisions of the Ninth Circuit and also touching upon different areas of the law. As the only law review in this nation exclusively dedicated to analyzing the decisions of the Ninth Circuit, the survey is special in one sense. It's also special in another in that the survey is largely what brings us together tonight. In addition to it being the 11th annual Chief Justice Ronald M. George Distinguished Lecture, tonight also marks the celebration of this year's release of the Ninth Circuit survey. 
Now, momentarily, you will hear from our two authors who are published in this year's survey. But first, we have a few thank yous. As many of you all know, this year, the Golden Gate University Law Review celebrates its 50th year of scholarship, um, which is amazing. Um, and of course, we have about 50 years worth of thank yous that we should technically be getting through, but I'm going to keep it brief. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, we would first like to extend a sincere thank you to Judge Kristen, who is an alum of the law school and who joins us tonight to present um, her lecture and whose presence um, in our celebration of a 50th year just makes it that much more special. So thank you, Judge Kristen. And we would also like to thank Judge Mormon, who's also an alum of the law school, um, for joining us tonight. Judge Mormon will be introducing Judge Kristen, and we really appreciate you taking out the time to do so. So thank you. Let's have a <laughs> Next, we would like to thank Dean Nidwicki, Emmy Pasternick, Wayman Hudson, Paul Gibson, Priscilla Phillips um, for helping us coordinate this event, as well as Professor Babcock, Dean Yates, Dean Bride. As you can tell, the list goes on, but we really do thank you. There are so many people who helped us coordinate this event, and I couldn't go without thanking them, so thank you as well. We would also like to extend our gratitude to Heather Veronini, who is our line editor for this year. And even above doing line edits, Heather goes above and beyond for us. And so we just want to share that we really appreciate it. And as well, um, furthermore, all the Law Review alumni who attended tonight are, have helped pave the way for us, really, and make us who and what we are today as a journal. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. promise I'm getting closer to the end here, but um, faculty, mentors, classmates, colleagues, families, friends, um, we thank you as well. And last but certainly not least, I extend, extend a personal and very heartfelt thank you to the current staff members of the Law Review for all your hours, maybe weeks, months worth of hard work and dedication. I couldn't quite find the words to properly express the depth of my gratitude for you all or the gratitude you really have for one another, but I hope you'll accept these few words that I just cobbled together. Um, and so with that, I would like to turn to the next part of our program, which is hearing from our two note authors. And so first, I would like to introduce to the podium our first author, Elisa Chavers. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to take this moment to share some of my own thank yous as well. Um, thank you to everyone here in attendance tonight for uh, helping us celebrate this truly momentous milestone for, for Golden Gate University Law Review, um, 50th edition. This is, this is a pretty cool thing. Um, so before I dive into my note, I want to take a moment to recognize those who made the publication of this piece possible. Um, thank you to last year's Law Review Board um, for believing in this note and to the current members of Law Review for all your help in the editing process. Um, to Professor McKenna, you were instrumental in helping me develop my legal writing abilities during my first year, so for that I thank you. To Heather Veronini, sitting right next to her, um, thank you for your help in transforming my absolute shabby, disorganized mess of a draft into this piece that was worthy of publication. Your comments and edits were truly invaluable. Um, Finally, a huge thank you to some of my best friends that are here um, to support me and to my husband, Jacob, in attendance tonight. Um, thank you for not only supporting me in law review and in law school, but in everything I pursue. Thank you. <sighs> All right. The title of my note is Williams v. Gay, further, further blurring the lines between inspiration and infringement. This explores the Ninth Circuit's 2018 opinion given in Williams v. Gay regarding music copyright infringement. During the summer of 2013, Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams' song, Blurred Lines, became wildly popular and occupied the top of music charts for weeks. The song was dubbed as Billboard Song of the Summer for 2013 and was the best-selling single in the same year. If you're sitting here thinking you don't know which song I'm talking about, just go back and listen to it after this, because you remember. It was pretty catchy and pretty controversial. But despite its success, there was a lot of controversy around the song over its misogynistic lyrics, racy music video that was, for a time, removed from YouTube. 
This controversy was only exacerbated by that infamous performance of the song in the 2013 VMAs with Robin Thicke and Miley Cyrus. Again, look it up later, you'll remember. <laughs> While Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams basked in the publicity that Blurred Lines was receiving, whether that was for better or worse, a separate controversy was brewing. Marvin Gaye was an influential R&B and soul singer in the 70s and 80s, and the voice behind hit songs like Ain't No Mountain High Enough and What's Going On. He passed away in 1984, and his family inherited the copyrights to several of his compositions. After the release of Blurred Lines in 2013, Marvin Gaye's family accused Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams of copying the so-called feel and sound of Marvin Gaye's 1977 Grammy-nominated song, Got to Give It Up. And this is where the litigation begins. The case began in the U.S. District Court in the Central District of California, with Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams seeking a declaratory judgment of non-infringement. Marvin Gaye's family counterclaimed, claiming copyright infringement. After the trial, the jury found in favor of Marvin Gaye's family, awarding over $4 million in damages. Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams appealed to the Ninth Circuit, where on March 21st, 2018, the Ninth Circuit affirmed the district court's ruling, holding that blurred lines did in fact infringe on the copyright and got to give it up. At the heart of the opinion was analysis of things such as whether there was error in the instructions given to the jury or improper admission of expert testimony during the trial in the district court. But buried in the court's opinion, lurked another issue that has long plagued music copyright, and that is the inverse ratio rule. The inverse ratio rule works like this. In an action for copyright infringement, a plaintiff's burden of proving substantial similarity is lowered when it can be shown that the defendant had a high degree of access to the plaintiff's musical work. This rule only works in one direction. That is, while a strong showing of access will result in a lower threshold showing of similarity, a weak showing of access does not require a greater showing of similarity between the plaintiff's and defendant's works. However, when the rule is applied, courts remain unsure of how less the showing of substantial similarity would be against a high showing of access. No court has been able to provide a standard for the so-called ratio itself. For example, does 15% greater access excuse 15% less similarity? Courts have yet to provide this answer. But on July 11th, 2018, only four months later, the Ninth Circuit issued an amended opinion to the Williams v. Gay case. The first and second opinions are virtually identical, with one glaring omission. All discussion of the inverse ratio rule is gone in the amended opinion. In the first opinion's discussion of the applicable standard in a copyright infringement claim, the court explained that they were bound by precedent to apply this rule in the Williams case. However, if the court was bound to apply the rule then it's reasonable to question why the rule was omitted entirely in the subsequent opinion, and yet the holding and the damages awarded to Marvin Gaye's family remained unchanged. By removing all discussion of the inverse ratio rule in the amended opinion, I believe the Ninth Circuit missed an opportunity to refine this rule. This may have also been the court's way of quietly retiring the rule once and for all. Irrespective of the Ninth Circuit reasoning for removing the rule in the amended opinion, my note argues two related points regarding the access requirement and copyright infringement actions. Number one, the access requirement should be presumed in every music copyright infringement claim because technological advancements have made music increasingly ubiquitous in our society. And number two, because a defendant's access to the plaintiff's music should be presumed, the inverse ratio rule should finally be abolished in copyright litigation. Technological advancements, such as music streaming services, have made a consumer's access to music easier than ever. Platforms like YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora, and SoundCloud, just to name a few, allow anyone with internet access to browse through each platform's library of music. Combined, Spotify and Apple Music have libraries of over 80 million songs and continue to add thousands of songs every day. The amount of paying subscribers for Spotify and Apple Music are 108 million, 60 million respectively, and those numbers keep rising. These numbers don't include the amount of people who choose not to pay for an account with either service and listen for free. Further, this does not include the 243 million Americans that the radio reaches every day. These statistics provide the reasoning behind why I argue that access should be presumed in music copyright actions. To succeed in a claim for copyright infringement, a plaintiff has to prove two things. One, that the defendant had access to the plaintiff's work. And two, that the works are substantially similar. For the first prong, to prove access, the plaintiff has to show that the defendant had a reasonable opportunity 
to view or copy the music. One way to prove this is through what's called the wide dissemination theory. Under this theory, the plaintiff proves access by showing that their particular musical work was widely distributed through extensive radio or television airplay, through, ra through record sales, or through the internet. The plaintiff does not have to prove that the defendant ever actually heard the plaintiff's song, only that they had the reasonable opportunity to hear it. To have the opportunity to listen to streaming platforms, consumers have to have access to certain devices, such as radios, TVs, smartphones, computers. And a recent study shows how a majority of the US population has access to such devices. Radio reaches 92% of the population, TV reaches 87%, and 81% have access to a smartphone. With numbers like these, the mere opportunity for a defendant to hear a particular song is always available. And in the circumstance where a defendant feels they truly did not have access to a plaintiff's song, then the burden should be on the defendant to overcome that presumption. Otherwise, with the current standard of proving access being satisfied so easily, then it should follow that access be presumed in all copyright actions so that the proceeding may stay focused on what is actually at the heart of copyright litigation and that substantial similarity. Which brings me to the final argument of my note and circles back to the inverse ratio rule. This rule should be abolished in copyright litigation because in our modern day, proving a defendant had a high degree of access to a particular song will nearly always be found to exist. And lowering a plaintiff's burden of proving similarity because the plaintiff's song was widely popular does nothing to solve whether the works are actually similar. Without the inverse ratio rule, the effect on copyright litigation is this. Whether a song was nominated for a Grammy in 1977 or dubbed Billboard's Song of the Summer in 2013, the standard of proof required to prove substantial similarity will remain consistent. Thank you all. Um, everyone, please welcome me and uh, or join me in welcoming our next speaker, Allison McCain. Good evening. Before I begin, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight, especially my mom, who has unwaveringly supported me in law school and beyond. Professor Christensen for his invaluable patience and guidance throughout my writing process. Heather Veronini for her thoughtful direction and critiquing my note. Professor Babcock and the Law Review staff, past and present, for their hard work in editing my note and believing in me enough to give me this opportunity. <sighs> the Constitution is credited as conferring to citizens a general right to be let alone. The court has gradually expanded on this right by acknowledging that there are zones of individual privacy that should be free from government interference. And more specifically, that the choices central to personal dignity and autonomy are central to the liberty protected by the Constitution. The Supreme Court has further acknowledged that this, excuse me, the Supreme Court has further acknowledged that this right to be let alone extends to all private consensual sexual conduct. My note is titled Constitutional Protection for the Public Employee in Matters Pertaining to Sex and it evaluates the case of Perez v. City of Roseville, a case so interesting that the Ninth Circuit decided it twice. <laughs> the issue here is whether and when a gov the government may use its position as an employer to infringe on the personal autonomy rights of the individual employee. Put another way, whether and to what extent a person must sacrifice aspects of her constitutional rights, in this case to privacy and intimate association, when she accepts a position with a government employer. Shortly after her appointment to the Roseville Police Department, Janelle Perez began a romantic relationship with a fellow officer, Shad Begley. Both officers were estranged from, though still legally married to other people. About six months into the relationship, Begley's estranged wife filed a citizen complaint alleging that the officers were engaging in sexual conduct while on duty. An internal affairs investigation found this allegation to be false, but did uncover the truth of the off-duty relationship. The investigation also revealed that the officers were using their cell phones excessively while on duty. However, uh, while this was a concern, it was found not to be one that warranted termination. Now, despite finding no merit to the allegation of on-duty sexual conduct, the department issued both, off both officers written reprimands, charging them with unsatisfactory work performance and conduct unbecoming. 
The commanding officers later made comments that they morally objected to Perez's extramarital sexual conduct. Perez was thereafter terminated with no further explanation. A week after her termination, Perez received a revised written reprimand that reversed the findings of unsatisfactory work performance and conduct unbecoming and introduced new charges of use of personal communication devices. Officer Perez sued, alleging that the department violated her constitutional rights to privacy and intimate association by basing her termination on its moral disapproval of her off-duty sexual conduct. The district court granted summary judgment for the defendants and Perez appealed to the Ninth Circuit. Now, the Ninth Circuit originally decided this matter in February 2018 in an opinion authored by Judge Reinhardt. In that opinion, the court held that the precedent set by the Ninth, the Ninth Circuit's 1983 decision in Thorn, in Thorn v. City of El Segundo, as well as the Supreme Court's decision in Lawrence v. Texas, governed the department's conduct and protected the, employee, the employee's privacy rights. In Thorne, the court held that this type of intrusion should be evaluated under heightened scrutiny, specifically that unless there's evidence that private off-duty activities negatively affect an employee's job performance or otherwise violate a constitutionally valid departmental policy, the government employer may not consider such information in its decision to reject or terminate an employment relationship. This analysis was strengthened by the seminal Lawrence v. Texas, in which the Supreme Court invalidated a Texas law prescribing homosexual conduct and, according to some interpretations, prohibited the state from using majoritarian bias to mandate its own moral code. Own moral code. <laughs> the court thus found that while the investigation was lawful because of the allegation of on-duty conduct, Perez's termination in light of the falsity of the allegations was not lawful. The court concluded that there was enough evidence to suggest that the department based its decision on the commanding officer's personal biases and remanded the case to the district court. Now, after the court issued its original opinion, a member of the court petitioned for a rehearing on Bonk, and before he was able to issue a final mandate, Judge Reinhardt passed away. The court thereafter withdrew its original decision and issued a new decision which draws contrary conclusions, which incidentally was shortly after I received my publication decision. <laughs> now, the court's 2019 currently binding decision relied on the revised phone usage reprimand to conclude that Perez's extramarital relationship did in fact affect her on-the-job performance. The court determined that Perez was not terminated because of department disapproval of her affair, but because of excessive cell phone use in connection with that affair. Further, the court interpreted the binding precedent in Thorne as explicitly rejecting a per se rule that a police department can never use its employees' sexual relations in personnel decisions. To this end, the court cited later, its later decisions, one which upheld the termination of officers who had engaged in sexual conduct with sex workers while on duty, and another that upheld a, an officer's termination for off-duty activity that amounted to criminal sexual misconduct. Considering these cases along with Thorne, the court determined that the precedents are not so clear that every reasonable officer would understand the constitutional impermissibility of considering Perez's extramarital affair as part of their ter termination decision when such affair led to inappropriate personal cell phone use while on the job. As such, the court affirmed the district court's grant of summary judgment, holding that the officers were entitled to qualified immunity. <sighs> <laughs> By redeciding this issue, the Ninth Circuit missed an opportunity to clarify the appropriate relationship between the interests of the government employer and the personal aut autonomy rights of its employee. The original Perez decision furthers the awareness of individual autonomy rights by acknowledging that the state may not stigmatize private sexual conduct simply because the majority has traditionally viewed a particular practice, such as extramarital sex, as immoral. This principle applies with equal force to the government employer as it does when the government is acting as a sovereign. After all, a citizen who works for the government is nonetheless a citizen. This means that the government employer, the government employers must not be permitted to take adverse action against an employee based on the employer's own conception of morality. If a government employer must interfere in the personal off-duty conduct of the employee, the employer must be required to show a significant interest in doing so. That is, the government's interest must be related to the employment relationship itself. 
The Ninth Circuit's conclusions in its first opinion appropriately apply a controlling precedent and appropriately, appropriately interpret the facts of the case. The court concluded early on that government intrusion into an employee's privacy and associational rights when not relevant to her on-the-job performance could not withstand any level of scrutiny. Now, it is certainly important that a police department maintain order within the department as well as the confidence of the public that it serves. However, employment with law enforcement, as with any government employer, does not minimize an employee's right to personal autonomy. Because the state cannot demean an individual's existence by penalizing her private sexual conduct, a government employer must show a significant impact on the employer's workplace to justify an unwanted interference. As the initial Perez opinion suggests, conduct unbecoming an officer is not a legitimate reason to warrant, warrant such an intrusion. In closing, I will leave you with a quote from the late Judge Reinhardt. As a society, we must remain solicitous of the constitutional liberties of, of public employees as of any citizens to the greatest degree possible and should be careful not to allow the state to use its authority as an employer to encroach excessively or unnecessarily upon the areas of private life, such as family relationships, procreation, and sexual conduct, where an individual's dignitary interest in autonomy is at its apex. Thank you.